Our next speaker is an unannounced 15-minute talk, um, basically about OpenXT and I assume people are really paranoid about running the software they expect to run. Uh, the first time I met Rich, he called Jeffro to have someone come talk at a platform security summit, and I was informed they were so old that they hadn't heard of the Octo project yet. And, so we used the word open embedded a lot, which was very confusing in those days. And I'm sure confused Jeff wrote it now and then. We um, still use okay. I know, I know. It's like change is hard for people. Um, and the last time I saw him, he organized the Platform Security Summit um, at a Microsoft facility. And I got to go and see it, and that was very exciting. And there was a lot of very interesting open embedded content, and there was a very long talk from uh, Intel about their, I'm not Intel, Microsoft, about their Yocto project work, which was very educational. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Um, so this is a, when we try to explain the, the sort of concepts and the material and the technology around OpenXT, it, it just kept getting bigger and bigger. So the last thing we tried, it took three days of talks. So I only have 15 minutes. Um, so I'm just going to sort of assume the entire three days as, as precursor, which you can obtain from that URL. Uh, the very short summary is that uh, in some use cases, historically there have been air gap machines. So you typically have a bunch of desktops on, on a separated, physically connected to different networks. Let's call them you know, red, orange, blue, and green. And over time, because you know there's need for mobility, um, everything is on vehicles or in small constrained spaces. You can't physically take six or seven desktops with you. So you, uh, uh, people have used virtualization as a shortcut, as an intermediate way of bringing this environment into a smaller physical uh, space. And so we've done that with um, Open Embedded, with Zen for virtualization, with VPNs underneath for different colored um, networks. And we run Windows uh, or Linux or FreeBSD, oh, some BSD guests on top of OE, <coughs> which controls the hardware. So Windows at the top to the user, open embedded, what we call DOM0 for Linux, uh, <coughs> and Zen on the map. The, the other concept here, because this particular uh, topic, this, this talk is about developers. So if you look at things around security, and the global supply chain and trust and, and so on. If you're a developer, we you wanna, you don't want a lot of trust in you or your dev box or your hardware. Because if there's a lot of trust in you, then you personally become a target. And there are a variety of ways to manipulate human beings and you don't wanna be subject to those ways. So the more that the infrastructure around you can remove the need for this person as a, as a vector of trust, um, you know, the less the attack surface in all possible ways, and also the things where you really want a human to be very, very carefully making decisions can be, can be narrowed and those can be explicit. So that's a more consent-based approach. Uh, Amazon, is, is, this is a very old thing, you know, it's almost 18 years now, and it's worth just a quick reminder, this is a paraphrased um, a Google, a very famous Google post about some of the concepts behind Amazon's internal design. So I just highlighted a few keywords. One is service interfaces, which might today be kind of interpreted as microservices, but that's just one subset. The other one is no shared memory. And the third one is externalizable. So no shared memory says, you, you can go crazy with your designs, but state is gonna be separated with hard boundaries. And so in OpenXT and in Zen and, and things we work on, there's, there is this hard rule, no shared memory. And so memory things are copied between you know, A and B. And during that copy, there's access control. There's some kind of mandatory set of rules that are applied every time uh, data moves. Externalizable is very important. Because you know, 20 years ago, you might have a design that says, here's my perimeter of my building, of my network, of my country, of my app. 
But as you can see from vulnerabilities and hackers, they don't really take word like perimeter or external very seriously. So there is no external. It's just, you know, it's all internal. Um, it's, it's just one flat space from a hacker. So if the developer from the very beginning is designing for it to be externalizable, they're going to just assume it's attackable. So, with those three sort of things laid out, uh, the other point is, um, you know, Amazon's made a lot of money since 2002, mm -hmm. and, and that money has changed the computing landscape tremendously. So, to the point where the CPUs that regular people use are not no longer the same as what that machine is able to use. You can have custom CPUs, and now they have an old ARM server CPU, which no other vendor has managed to bring to the job market. So. No matter what we may think about that model, that model is kind of like steamrolling over our minds. One of the early uh, design objectives which we partially met for OpenXT was to have a box <coughs> which could have more than one owner, which appears contradictory. Um, and part of the reason for that was, imagine if you had you know, six boxes of different <coughs> colors, and I want to smash them together in one box. Everyone says, well, how do I know I trust that box to keep that separation uh, in a reliable state? And back to my earlier point about reducing the amount of trust you have in any particular person or organization, the, the sort of architecture you end up with is having the thing that does separation be as small as humanly possible and then to delegate rights out to these other pieces. Yeah? Could you please clarify what OpenXD is for people who don't know that? So that is the thing I mentioned at the beginning. It's the software that runs uh, Windows or Linux uh, on a single box with open embedded in Zen underneath it. Um, it's collapsing air, multiple air gap machines. It's similar to Cubes OS, if you've if you seen Cubes. How many folks here are familiar with cubes? <coughs> okay, you should maybe get a picture of cubes next time. So just think of your desktop and you have a window manager, and there's colored borders around some windows, let's say red, green, and blue, but those windows are not apps, those windows are VMs, and the VMs are isolated. Uh -huh. uh, it could also be full screen, so I have a hotkey to switch between them. But the key thing is, the workloads are untrusted, so one could be classified and unclassified, one could be Google and Amazon, or different countries. Or Tor versus Britain versus the EU. All sorts of math. <laughs> BSD versus Linux. Um, so, the main thing here is that the there, there are keys, there are identities, there's encryption, and so the question is how can you have you know, the sysadmin be delegated out into different stakeholders? The other part of this diagram that's important is the licensing model. So the core OS and the core pieces are, are open, but because we're using VM interfaces for the other parts, you can have you know, proprietary code sitting in the VM that's talking over an inter VM communication to a piece of open code. And so you can mix and match the two. And some of that could be open, commercial, or classified. So this will take a long time to go through all these pieces. Um, but from, for this particular presentation, the main point is that the trust is rooted in some way in the hardware. And historically, that's meant something like a TPM. There's something called also VRTM, Dynamic Root of Trust, which is able to measure the firmware every time you boot to show that it's not been tampered with, it's been the same hash. You know, it has the same hash as it was the last time you measured it. And that matters a lot now because as the OSs have become hardened, one of the last places remaining to get persistence is the firmware. So if you can compromise the firmware, you can reinstall your OS and you're still compromised. And so your dev bill can have modifications to you know, various things. One small piece here that's interesting is if I do if I have an OS and the OS is reloaded and I do an update, how do I know when I come up the next time after I boot that it's got the correct measurements? 
So we have available today at OpenXT, it's on, on GitHub. We can pre-calculate the measurements during an OTA update and know exactly what it will be the next time you come up. And as far as we know, that's one of the few places <coughs> that's publicly available. Um, word edge has been used a bit. The cloud versus edge. The fundamental motivation, one of them, is the speed of light is not subject to change. And so latency, either in mobile environment or for any kind of sensor, um, visual, AR, or even uh, security-based operation, is uh, there, there are benefits to doing it as close to the, to the source of data as possible. And so if you want to do local things today, the question is, are you now, um, you know, do you just skip the last 10 years of cloud technology? Do you, do you just, that's all kind of missing, right? So there are a few projects trying to do that. One of, one of them is from the Linux Foundation called Linux Foundation Edge, which is bringing all the container APIs that you, some people know and love or, or not, to the Edge. But the, the point is you can have on a small device, uh, under the developer's control, a, a box. And that box can have high integrity. And it can do that with pieces from OE, from OpenXT, and some things I'll show you. These are three pieces of hardware that look innocuous, but actually have things that historically have not been available. So the one on the left is eight cores um, and a 35 watt TDP. And it's about, you know, it's about this big, it's very small. It's an AMD Epic, which is the brand name for the service cube. It's for embedded, uh, so it's a similar core, you know, it's a Zen core from Ryzen. And what the key is, it's got something called SKNet, which is DRTM, dynamic root of trust, and it can do these measurements when it comes up. It also has an early implementation of SEB, which is encryption that supports, you know, guest isolation from the hypervisor. So back to tr trusting or untrusting things. Today, everyone trusts the hypervisor. It's got ownership of the machine. AMD is working fairly hard to, to reduce the need to do that trust with keys that are rooted in the hardware that limit the visibility of the hypervisor into guest um, And today, the, you can either buy a very expensive Epic server to get that, or this box, which is relatively affordable and can fit in the desk. The Lenovo P330 is very small, it's about this big. <coughs> the key is it's got an actual PCI slot in there, and you can put a card, like a Quadnik Intel into it. And so that gives you a pretty nice little test box. And this last one is a very small APU2, you probably have seen it, it's about this big. And it's around $150 to $200. Its property is that it runs, it's a tracking property, it runs core boot. It's on a seven year uh, life cycle for an embedded CPU, so it's an older, pretty, pretty zen CPU. But it has SKNet as well. So it can prove to itself every time it comes up that the, it's not been tampered with on the firmware side of the OS. So the reason you want that is because if you're doing a development build or you're doing tests, how do you know that your test server is not compromised? So the backdoor that was put in is not going to have the test server you know, hiding the effects of that backdoor. And ultimately what you want to do is capture the environment and the integrity of the test machine and the device under test to show that it's not been tested. In order to do that, the machine that's collecting all the data itself must have some root of trust. So, the, the, the point here is that these the, the keys in these machines in these machines are under you, you know your org or your development authority. It's not a cloud provider, it's not someone And so we're trying, or I'm trying specifically, to take OpenXT. OpenXT is not really designed to be an end user product project. Uh, Cubes is very much focused on a specific set of workflows, so that's why you don't hear much about OpenXT. OpenXT is currently used mostly for government uh, derivatives, which are not public, but are deployed and uh, supported. 
So the goal here is to build an open derivative that is able to benefit from the investment that goes into OpenXT, including testing against these different types of hardware, and to provide something that's useful to developers. So the initial focus is on build integrity and test integrity. We have the ability to have read-only VMs, stateless VMs are part of the state as persistent as the part is not. Um, since it's, it is VMs, we, we have a variety of management capabilities to version things. So you can you know run different tests, including bisection if you need to. Just to be clear, this does not exist yet. This is what I'm trying to build. I have a prototype of it. Um, <clears throat> that's something that's come up quite a bit. There's a in the last year there's been automated testing summit from from the Yucto side and kernel CI testing on Red Hat. They have all you know talked about the partitioning between hardware specific testing of boards and VM based testing, which is easier and faster. And so if you look at the Yocto LTS discussion, it's only on VMs, it's not hardware specific. The assumption is the board vendor is going to deal with the hardware testing. In the real world, it doesn't quite work that way. It's not quite so uh, you know, black and white. So with Zen, we have the ability to partition the hardware. And we can have you know, these devices virtualized and these devices go through the guest, because you pass through, like, say, the specific name for the specific FPGA. So you can do some, you know, some hardware testing. Or if you're a problematic driver, you can make that virtual. So the, the key here is the flexibility exists in the plumbing. Uh, I want to make, you know, anyone can do this, right? Anyone can grab KVM or Zen and unroll this piece of it. It's just too expensive. Uh, the challenge in all of these environments is how can I turn, how can I iterate uh, as quickly as possible? To, okay, I'll almost finish this one more slide. How can I iterate as quickly as possible from, as, a as a developer to get the information I need? So we want to find out here is what are the workflows that people need, what are the most important things they want to do, and make those very, very easy with a few clicks. Just, just a few to start. But the ultimate goal is because, because we need security, the security has to be rooted in hardware, and the unfortunate thing is, OEMs do not do a very good job of producing good hardware. So the real goal of this is to get this as a standardized test, piece of test infrastructure that will be going into the factory floor of the machines we buy. So before they get to us, they have to pass these tests. And today, that's all proprietary tests. Um, so getting to an open environment, I think, would be a step forward. And having developers use that exact same thing in their job would be um, would be a win. One small note here: copy and write BitBake. We have a piece of technology called MicroZen, which was from circa 2012-ish, which preceded things like uh, Lambda and Functions and MicroVMs. But there's now a MicroVM uh, machine type in QMU with spun out of Firecracker work. At, uh, at AWS and Intel. It is, it was originally created for web browser uh, isolation. So every tab in the browser, every HTTP request, we get a separate VM, copy and write, instantiated just for that moment. And then it would decide which, which side effects of that to persist back to the user. So this exists today. It's shipping on millions of HP laptops today. And it's completely proven. The code has been open source a year ago. And so in theory, you could spin up a MicroZen VM for every bit bake operation, especially to hit the network. And we can decide what side effects to persist from that. We just have the output. If any malware came down or if anything strange happened during that invocation, we could record it and analyze it later. So that's a little forward looking, but it's all possible and it's been proven in other use cases. And one other piece that's kind of cool is a project called PyVMI Debug, which is um, basically using something called VM introspection. It's a library that exists for KVMs and, and possibly other hypervisors, actually. So you can get this on GitHub today. We can integrate this into TinBench, into the derivative of OpenXT, so that you can debug apps or processes in the guest seamlessly uh, without any modifications. So 
So there's basically a lot of cool toys to be, to be glued together. If anyone's interested in helping or working with us, we'd love to talk to you. That's it. I've had a bit of practice watching talks like this, and so you're building secure software or software to make a platform secure without embedded, but you're building it on a machine that you don't know is secure. We're so you have this chicken and egg problem, yep. and you're depending on us to get the build right. Uh, well, not only that, the build itself has to, you know, the things we use to check whether the hardware is secure have to be built somewhere and then yeah. built on equally untrusted hardware. Yeah. So, yeah. There, there, uh, yeah, there's many topics, there's many things we can talk about here, but yeah. you know, if, you, if you talk to, a, a great thing is just talk to real low level hardware engineers who will tell you, you know, there is no <clears> one or zero. We kind of like proximately get to a one or zero. <laughs> So if they have to deal with that, we can figure it out. Yeah. I think higher. But the key is not to assume anything is good. It's just to have. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you.